Over the last two years, government IT leaders across federal, state, and local government have witnessed unprecedented levels of cyber threats against their networks. To better protect their systems, uh, government IT leaders must operate under a new set of standards of security rules and regulations. I'm Wyatt Cash with Scoop News Group, and joining us to talk about the state of security in government is Mark Moffat, Senior Engineering Leader and Chief Technology Officer for U.S. Public Sector at Cisco. Mark, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Wyatt. Great to see you again. It's my pleasure to be here. So, Mark, as government agencies look to their 2022 security priorities, uh, what security threats should they really be uh, focused on most uh, for IT leaders? Yeah, why? great question. I, I think uh, the year of 2021 has now come and gone, but it's clearly emerged as, as the year of ransomware. I think going into 2021, people knew it was going to be big. I'm not sure people knew how big. I, I've seen some interesting stats, upwards of 700 million uh, ransomware attacks last year. That's 134% uh, increase. That's skyrocketing. And you're, you're talking the cost of millions and millions and millions of dollars. And, and I think out uh, <clears throat> toward uh, 20, the, the end of the, the decade here, they're talking about this cost in uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of $6 trillion. So it's a huge problem. And clearly when you think about uh, ransomware attacks, we think often of industry, critical infrastructure, manufacturing, retail technology. But if you look at the 28 uh, things that are tracked against, if you will, industries, whatever you want to call them, Government is number eight on the list. So we're in the top 10 uh, of, of targets, if you will, for these for these folks going after this uh, monetary base that's out there. Those are very sobering numbers. Um, let me ask next then, so how is Cisco shifting its outlook on security to meet the needs of their government partners and customers? Yeah, so uh, first of all, I'll say this, Why? what's interesting is uh, the, the thing about the hacking community, the attackers, look, they have unlimited attempts. Uh, they've got unlimited resources. There's a lot of money behind this. And, and so us as defenders, I'll say we have to respond every time, right? So this requires immense visibility, rapid intelligence, and the ability to respond in an in-kind status, if you will. So uh, from a Cisco perspective, what, what we're doing about it, I, I think in a lot of uh, ways, we often get lumped into, I'd say the security vendor community. But one of the things I've really wanted to continue to emphasize is Cisco really is a cybersecurity company and a cybersecurity aware <clears throat> partner who really looks at, I'll call it the new trust standard in this framework of First, zero trust, of course, that's critically important. You want to think about, obviously, the, the components that give you that zero trust capability, but also think about managing supplier risk. Supplier risk, like is your, are the people you're working with uh, securing their gear? Do they have trusted systems? Do they have a trusted supply chain? We all know about the supply chain attacks this past year. They've been here very heavy. Then you think about data rights, data privacy, that's obviously been top of mind for everybody as, as data is shared more freely. Uh, people are starting to realize that it's not a good thing to be tracked and everybody knowing everything about you. So data privacy, data, data rights are, are big and Cisco is very focused on that. Next is transparency. We wanna make sure that customers are aware of the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? We're not perfect. Everybody, I think, has uh, been impacted some way by Log4j recently. We were very quick with our um, incident response team and our PCERT team to issue what problems we had with our equipment, what gear needed to be patched, and those type of things. And then lastly is improving it, right? We need to make sure that we're putting our money where our mouth is by having things like FedRAMP compliance and HIPAA and PCI and all those type things that customers care about. So those, that five part trust standard or framework, if you will, is the way I would love to make sure uh, Cisco is being viewed in the industry outside of clearly just delivering world-class security products. Well, you mentioned a lot of areas. Let me focus in a little bit on zero trust specifically. It's certainly become a hot topic, uh, particularly after the release of the White House Executive Order on Cybersecurity last May. Um, most federal agencies are 
taking a critical look and uh, critical steps to establish a zero trust architecture. What can state leaders learn from this executive order to establish their own roadmap to zero trust? Bill, I, I think right, Wyatt, the, uh, the thing about zero trust, first of all, it's, it's pretty easy to net out, right? You wanna verify every connection from every device every time. And so it really is that simple. So, um, and that, that applies by the way to even our senior leaders, myself, but also agency, city, state, federal government leaders. You wanna make sure that, first of all, when you think about <clears throat> uh, identity uh, management and access, first of all, or, are we allowing people based on not IP uh, addresses, which can be spoofed, usernames, those type of things, but are we who we say we are? And then you have multi-factor authentication. So I may know who you are, but let me do a little bit of a double check using things like biometrics and, and those type of things to, <clears throat> excuse me, validate whether you who you say you are. Then you have endpoint security. So you want to also make sure that once they're in the system that, you know, they're, they're not bringing any malware, uh, those type things. Uh, we've also got the, the network, which is critical, right? So things like software defined wide area networking, which are uh, obviously the new way for wide area networking to get traffic from a remote location to the application, regardless of where it lives. But you also have that, that sassy umbrella, if you will, where all of your DNS security and uh, secure web gateways and all those type of things kind of fit in this bucket, if you will, of ensuring that you've got the right packet treatment without having to bring everything back to a corporate site. So when you think about zero trust, it really is, let's say, a layered approach. You want to think about, obviously, the end user and who they are. Again, you want to think about how their end systems are protected and cared for. You want to certainly take a strong look at the network, the network matters, and then obviously uh, other things there, just policy and those type of things. So it's very critical. Zero Trust is much bigger again than just a few products stitched together to make sure that uh, we're keeping honest people honest. I appreciate the way you've outlined that. Uh, and then lastly, Mark, um, skills gaps continue to be a challenge for government agencies in tackling critical cybersecurity issues. How are you seeing agencies embrace partnerships with industry and industry experts to tackle some of these you know, biggest security challenges when it comes to skills? So one of my, one of my favorite customer uh, references uh, <clears throat> is Baltimore Police Department. Uh, and the quote from Ben Lohr, I think is gold, basically said that, uh, look, bad actors only need to be right once. And so uh, when you think about what Baltimore's done under, under Ben's leadership uh, as their director of infrastructure, he came in, uh, they had some challenges and what Ben was able to do, again, going back to that trusted partner, he, he, was, com he was comfortable with Cisco because we did those things that I communicated earlier around trust. But then he basically took exactly what I just communicated earlier is he he looked at a defense in depth approach, right? They got the network right. Uh, he said they had some config errors and those type of things. So the first thing they wanted to do is get the network piece right, make sure that they segmented the network appropriately and that cuts down your attack vector, if you will. So if you do have a problem, you're isolating that to a local area. And then he implemented exactly what I said earlier. He used our tools for identity management. He got endpoint security working and functioning right. Uh, he, he basically got uh, <clears throat> several of our leverage in our Talos group and some of the things they do with incident response and also awareness, leverage in that threat intelligence, if you will, to make decisions. And then he came over the top with, a, with our XCR platform just to make sure that everything was being coalesced up into a single system using AI so that he could really make uh, important, decisive uh, decisions about uh, what the what the new CTO wanted, which is to get more mobility of the force out of the field. So no longer were people working from the office. They really did have a strategy to, to get them out of the community. And doing that, you therefore put a lot of laptops, a lot of tablets, a lot of things out on the street that now need a different level of protection. So between Ben uh, and the new CTO, they were really great partners with Cisco and bringing that together uh, to deliver a solid uh, security strategy to get the PD to do what they do best and that's protecting the community. Really appreciate your walking through all the dimensions of that example. 
Well, Mark Moffat, thank you so much for joining us today to talk about, you know, really kind of setting a new standard of security to meet modern security threats at federal, state, and local government. Thank you, Wyatt. It was a pleasure to be here.